Say to God, come on, put those hands together. Let's praise him today. Yes, it's just something about Sunday morning. Well, that I can't on, wait. All Sunday morning, Sunday morning, to sing and shout, sing and shout. And praise the Lord. Well, Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. We are the Holgate Street Church of Christ. It is such a pleasure to have you with us this morning. We're going to worship God and we invite you to join us. The call to worship this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. And it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. We are truly blessed. Let's pray. Father, we're humbled by your goodness, by what you have done to us and for us. Father, we're excited to be here to worship you this morning. We ask that you bless our time together. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. I'm gonna let it shine. I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Yonder come my name. And in my example, y'all, I got to let it shine. Yonder come my neighbor, I'm gonna let it shine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Would you pray with me? Father, we continue our worship to you this morning, this time of prayer. We thank you so much that we were invited to your throne. We know that you are almighty, all-powerful, that you are loving. Father, we thank you for this time where we can pour our hearts out to you. 
with all of our requests. Father, we thank you for your love and for your care, for your faithfulness, for your patience with us. Father, for the fact that you will never leave us or forsake us. We thank you for your abiding presence. Father, we thank you for the ability that we have to come together in this way this morning to worship you, to think of you, to concentrate on you and what you have done for us. Thank you for the unity that services like this bring to us. Father, for the struggles that we go through that pull us together. Father, we want to thank you for this current struggle, even though that we know that uh, many people are, are getting sick and many people are struggling, Father, to know that we are fighting it together in your name. Father, thank you for all those who are working so hard to make sure that these services happen. I want to thank you for the people filming it, for the people working on it during the week. Father, for the people who come down here to, to help prepare for it. Father, we uh, pray for your continued grace and mercy upon us. Continue to watch over and bless us. Father, we uh, know that in times of trouble, you are right there beside us, that you are going through this trouble with us, that you are protecting us. Father, we ask that you would help us to remove the anxieties that we have. We ask that you help us to replace it with the renewed faith and confidence in you and your ability to care for us and to solve our problems. Father, we pray for everyone who is affected by this virus. Father, so many of testing positive, so many are coming down with symptoms. Father, we ask your blessing on each one. Father, we pray for those who have severe symptoms, who are truly struggling with health. Father, we pray that you would heal them. Father, we know that many are losing jobs, that many are not able to go to work, not able to go to school. Father, not able to live their lives the way that they have become accustomed. Father, we ask that you would be with them and help them, that you would bring them relief and help. Father, we pray for those who continue to work on the front lines, for all of those in healthcare fields, grocery store workers, people where we get gas and buy our food. Father, be with all of them. Father, we pray that you would protect them. Father, we ask that you continue to be with the family here at Holgate. We pray for the leadership here, that you would give us the wisdom and discernment that we need. Father, we pray that you would be with every member. Father, we pray that you would bless them and protect them. Father, we pray that you would help us to be an encouragement to one another in times of trouble, that you would help us to reach out to one another and look out for one another. Father, we want to pray for the forgiveness of our sins and our shortcomings, for all those times when we allow selfishness and stubbornness and doubt to pull us away from you. Father, we pray that uh, you would forgive us for those times. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all the promises that are in it, for how it reminds us of how faithful you are, how good you are, how powerful you are. Father, we thank you for this morning and the lesson that we have to study this morning. We ask that uh, you would be with the presenter. We know it will be a blessing to us. Father, help each one of us to look for something that will enrich our lives and help us. Father, we continue to pray for your abiding presence in our lives, that you will continue to guide us, that you would continue to protect us, that you would continue to provide for us. All these things we pray for in the name of Christ. Amen. I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. 
I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. 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 He is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. We have come to that part of our service where we have the opportunity to commune around the Lord's table and remember the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I would like to read a few verses from Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse 4, and it reads, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We're so blessed, so blessed to have a Lord and Savior like him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have just to pause and remember what Jesus did for us. All the things that we have because of him. Father, to remember that he took our place. Father, as we partake of this bread, help us to see the body of our Lord and Savior hanging on the cross. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to see his blood that was shed for us. Father, bless us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. I will call upon the Lord, I will call upon the for Lord. He is worthy to be praised, so praised. shall I be saved so from, my I saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. We now have the opportunity to give back to God some of what he has entrusted to us. I'd like to read a few verses from Luke, the 21st chapter. It talks about what real giving is. And it says, He looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance has put in offering for God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. 
What a great example. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to give back. Father, we thank you for the example that we have read about this morning. We thank you for her true heart of giving. Father, we want to have that same heart. We ask that you would bless us. Father, we ask that you would bless our offering this morning, that you would bless us as we use it. Father, we just appreciate all that you've given to us and entrusted us with. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. There are three ways that you can give this morning. The first way is to go to our website, holgatecfc.com, hit the Donate tab, and enter your information there. The second way is through the Zelle app, where you can send your contribution to treasurer at holgatecfc.com. The third way is you can mail your contribution to Holgate Street Church of Christ, Box 18226, Seattle, Washington, 98118. Thank you, and may God bless you. I keep falling in love with in him love over and over, over and over and over and over again. again. I keep falling, I in, keep love falling with him in love with him over and in love over and over and over again. He gets sweeter, he gets sweeter and sweeter as the years go by. by. Oh, what a oh, love! Between my Savior and I, he falling in love, in love, over and over, over and over again. He keeps blessing me, oh what a love, over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me, he's blessing me. Welcome and thank you for joining us uh, this morning. I've been getting some great news about the fact that you are uh, sharing uh, this broadcast with uh, your friends and family members. Uh, it is recorded, so there's some flexibility in terms of uh, when you're able to watch it. So thank you very much for joining us today. Also, we have some uh, live opportunities. Uh, first of all, Kids Talk is today at 12.15. And then at 5 o'clock, we log on live to take your prayer requests and to pray for you. Just go to the website, holgatecoc.com, and click on the links. And we hope you can join us uh, for those. Also, if you're interested in becoming a Christian or learning more about uh, the gospel of Christ, more about our church or ministries, if you're interested in being baptized or have other needs, please write to us um, at contact us at holgatecoc.com. Well, this coming uh, Thursday is uh, Thanksgiving, and uh, it's one of my favorite uh, times of the year. And I hope that uh, this uh, whole week you can uh, take some time to reflect on the things for which we're thankful. Even though we're going through uh, many challenges uh, in life and throughout the world, uh, we can be thankful that we serve a great God, that He's with us always, especially in our times of trial. Today, we're going to continue our series, uh, Strength for the Journey. And we are uh, just about finished uh, with the series, um, including this message today. Uh, I'll have two more messages. And we have been uh, sharing with you some uh, truths from God's Word about the various types of journeys that we go on. 
So we've talked about our spiritual journeys, we've talked about our health journeys, both uh, our physical health and our mental health. We've talked about our relationship journeys, and then uh, last week we talked about our financial journeys. Well, today we're going to talk about our work-life journeys, and then in two weeks, uh, because next week um, Brother Baron Jones will be delivering the message online. So in two weeks, we'll wind up the series by talking about what I call our success journey. So uh, today, uh, let's talk about our work-life journey. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about work. Um, and of course, work has, uh, uh, has been in the news over the last year, you know, given the pandemic and you know, people working at home and changes in the nature of work and so forth. But the Bible has a lot to say about work. Uh, and we find in the very beginning, in the book of Genesis, God pictured as one who works. Uh, he begins uh, with the work of creation. And uh, for six days, uh, God works and then He uh, ceases from His labor on the seventh day. When God creates Adam, uh, He places him in the garden. And, you know, He just doesn't place him in the garden to, to just run around and do nothing. Uh, but he places him there uh, so that he can work the garden and to take care of it. So uh, work and the idea of work is something that is good. Now in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, everything changed. Uh, everything uh, including work. And what happened was work then became toil. In Genesis 3, uh, beginning at verse 17... Uh, the Bible uh, says that God said, uh, cursed is the ground because of you. He's speaking to Adam. And through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Now, uh, before then, um, all Adam had to do was to you know, go, go to a tree and pick off its fruit. But now the ground is cursed because of sin. And God said, it will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field, and by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. And so we see then that in the beginning, work, work was great. Work was a blessing, and uh, it was sin that got in the way, and work then became toil. What I want to do uh, today, I want to talk about three areas. So let me give them to you up front and then we'll develop them as we uh, uh, extend this message. So three ideas that we're going to talk about when it comes to work. First of all, I want to talk about uh, your choice of work, your choice of work. Secondly, I want to talk about your purpose for work. So your choice of work, your purpose for work. And then thirdly, I want to talk about your relationships at work. So you got them? Your choice of work, your purpose for work, and then your relationships at work. Let's begin. First of all, uh, let's talk about your choice of work. And let me kind of share my own story. Um, when children are young, uh, adults ask the question, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? And uh, I, I don't remember my answers early as a child. I, I know I had lots of interests, but I really wasn't thinking about working at that time. I was into playing and enjoying myself. But I think it was in high school that I really started to think about my future. And I recall um, at Holgate, uh, at the church, uh, we had a career day. And we were downstairs, and in the classrooms, uh, there were various individuals who represented uh, different professions. And I remember uh, Brother Bill Harper, who used to be the preacher at the uh, Southside Church of Christ. Uh, he was uh, here on career day, and he was in the classroom. And over the door uh, was, was the profession of, of ministry and being a minister. Now, I have to say that for the whole time that, that I was there at the event, I was the only one that went to that room. But we had a great talk about ministry and uh, uh, we shared that. Now, I think I've kind of always had this desire to, to be engaged in ministry. I started when I was very young in terms of preaching and teaching. But I also uh, made a decision that I wanted to be a bivocational preacher. In other words, 
Um, just as Paul not only preached the gospel, he was a, a worker of leather, um, I wanted to do something in addition, because I've got lots of interest. And so when I entered college, um, I decided I wanted to do something in the medical field. I think probably part of that had to do with my dad. Um, growing up in Tennessee, uh, he had the desire to go to medical school, but that door was not open to him, along with a lot of other African Americans uh, years ago. And so he chose uh, the profession of teaching. But I, but I was thinking about the medical field uh, for one reason, um, uh, it, it was going to be a, a field that was going to be around for a long time. People were going to always be sick. Um, I'm a Star Trek fan. Dr. McCoy is there on the Enterprise, you know, and this is years in the future. So I figured uh, medical field is going to be around for a long time. So I majored in biology and, uh, of course, thinking about, you know, becoming a doctor. Uh, one summer, I volunteered at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. And uh, it's, it's the large medical center where they, you know, bring all of the extreme cases, you know, the gunshot wounds and all kind of things. And uh, so I volunteered there. And during that time, I had an opportunity to talk with the medical director. He actually stopped by and, uh, you know, knew that I was there. I felt very special because of that. And we had a discussion and I asked him some questions about, you know, what it meant really to be a doctor and what that took. Well, one of the things he described to me, he said, well, you know, early in my career, um, I had a family, had a couple kids, and, and what I would do when I would get off at three in the morning, I would have my wife to wake our kids up, and I'd play with them for a couple hours, and I'd go back to work. And I was thinking, well, that's, that's no way to raise a family, because I was interested in, in raising a family. Um, and then he said, uh, also, if you're going to go into medicine, you want to make sure you specialize. Because when you think about the medical field, it's, it's continuing to develop, and there's just so much knowledge, so much information, you're going to need to be studying all the time. So I would suggest that you, uh, you specialize. Well, I thought about that, and I thought, well, you know, I'm interested in biology and that field, um, but, but when it comes to uh, a body of knowledge and something I wanted to really uh, become an expert in, it wasn't biology. And I thought to myself, you know, I'd, I'd really rather spend all that time studying the Bible. Now, um, so I decided as a result of that experience that I, I didn't want to become a doctor. Uh, still in college, I um, then explored medical art because, you know, I, I like art. It's pretty good at, at drawing and that kind of thing. And so I uh, interviewed a medical artist up at Virginia Mason Hospital. Uh, one of the professors at, uh, at our, our, our school, uh, uh, Seattle Pacific University, uh, physiology professor, he was writing a textbook and he needed some illustration, so I, I spent hours illustrating it. And uh, uh, quite frankly, I got bored with doing all those drawings. Now, today they use computers, but back then we drew illustrations by hands for, for doctors. Well, it wasn't until the fall quarter of my senior year, I took a vocational seminar. Every senior was required to spend a, an entire quarter exploring a particular profession. And so the profession I chose to explore was health administration. I uh, had, had gone through uh, the graduate catalog from University of Washington and came upon the School of Public Health and Community Medicine Health Administration. So I spent the entire quarter uh, interviewing people, uh, writing a paper, I said, that, that's what I want to do. And so uh, after I finished uh, my undergraduate degree and I worked for a year, I was accepted to the master's program in, uh, at the University of Washington School of Public Health and Community Medicine. I completed that program in uh, 1981, uh, relocated to Portland, Oregon, worked for a couple of hospitals there, got a commission in the Navy, worked for a naval hospital um, at the Lemoore uh, Naval Air Station south of Fresno, California. And it was while I was there that the church here, the Holgate Street Church of Christ, the church that I'd grown up as, uh, in as a child, uh, the church here, the leaders called me and uh, invited me to become the preacher. That was in 1981. And so I've been in preaching uh, ever since then. But at the same time, I've been bivocational, preaching and doing some other things as well, both in terms of health and in terms of teaching. So that, that's just a, a brief description of, uh, of how I got into what I'm doing, what I've been doing for the last 30 years or so. Uh, but there's some principles, I think, that we can, we can take away, uh, some factors. Let me mention three factors that impact our choice 
of work. The number one factor is spiritual giftedness. Spiritual giftedness. Uh, the Bible speaks of, of spiritual gifts. In uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, beginning at verse number 6, let me read uh, a couple of verses here. Romans 12, beginning at verse 6, the Apostle Paul tells the church at Rome, he says, we have different gifts. Now, these gifts are not uh, miraculous gifts like the ability to heal or to speak in languages that you've never studied, but these are, are non-miraculous service gifts. So, so the Bible teaches about uh, miraculous sign gifts which have passed away, but it also teaches about non-miraculous service gifts. And so he tells the church, he says, we have different gifts according to the grace that's given us. He says, if a man's gift is prophesying, and, and by prophesying, he's not talking about foretelling the future. He's talking about uh, the function of proclaiming the truth, or we would call it preaching. He says, if a man's gift is prophesying, then let him use it uh, in proportion to the faith. If it's serving, he says, then let him serve. If it's teaching, then let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, then let him give generously. If it's leadership, then let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, then let him do it cheerfully. I believe God has given me the gift of teaching. Now, my favorite definition of a spiritual gift is a God-given motivation. It's a motivation. God has planted it within us. We are all motivated to serve the body of Christ in some way. So God has given us all a motivation. And, and I think when you look at uh, uh, these uh, gifts that are listed here in Romans 12, I think at least one of them resonates with, with each person. So, so I believe God has given me the gift of teaching. And so I've had the opportunity to exercise that gift both in the church and also in the world as well. So when it comes to our choice of work, the first factor that should impact that is our spiritual giftedness. Now the second factor uh, is effectiveness, effectiveness. The first factor of spiritual giftedness has to do with how God has motivated us to serve as a part of the body of Christ. The second factor of effectiveness has to do with uh, uh, how good are we at doing that thing. A lot of times we believe we're gifted at something. So, for example, if I believe I'm, I'm gifted at teaching, but yet no one wants to be my student, no one wants to come to my class, no one wants to listen to me in terms of my instruction, uh, I probably don't have that gift. And so when it comes to, to our work, um, there's a lot of satisfaction when uh, we have... Uh, effectiveness, we have high standards, we do it well, and even maybe do it uh, better than most folks. And so uh, there's this element of quality. And what's uh, interesting is in the, uh, the text in uh, Romans 12, there's some suggestions of effectiveness or quality. So for example, uh, you know, when he says, um, uh, if your gift is, is giving, then give generously. If it's leading, do it diligently. If it's showing mercy, uh, then do it cheerfully. There's some qualitative element even in that particular text. So the first, the first principle then in terms of our, our choices uh, of work has to do with our spiritual giftedness, has to do with our effectiveness. And then the third uh, quality has to do with our enjoyment, our enjoyment. What I simply mean here is that uh, we should do what we like. Uh, there's been various... Uh, statistics and studies about work and it suggested that 80% of people who work uh, don't enjoy what they do. Uh, you know, no one, no one uh, expresses uh, the statement, uh, thank God it's Monday. You, you don't hear that. It, what is it? It's, thank God it's Friday. Why? Because, well, it's the weekend. We're not working anymore. And so most people don't enjoy that, their work. And, and that's really too bad. Um, because work, work is designed for us to, to gain enjoyment. Solomon, uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 5, uh, verses 18 through 20, this is what he says. He says, This is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and, listen to this, 
to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life that God has given them. Now, did you hear that? Uh, Solomon said this is, this is good, that a person can find some sense of satisfaction in their work, in their toilsome labor. Here's what verse 19 says. It says, moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, and we talked a little bit about that last week, he says to accept their lot and to be happy in their toil. God says this is a gift of God. He says they seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. And so work uh, should be enjoyable, something you love to do. So that's some thoughts about choice of work. Let's, let's talk secondly then about your purpose for work. Your purpose for work. Uh, the question is why, why should we work? Well, let me give you four brief reasons. The first reason uh, that we're called to work is that, that a, a working person reflects the character of God. A working person reflects the character of God. Uh, again, Genesis uh, uh, 1 and 2, God worked in creation from his labor on the seventh day. Uh, Jesus worked. There are a number of passages in, in the New Testament that speak of the work of Christ. Uh, John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. Jesus recognized that, that what sustained Him, what, what He pursued, what He enjoyed, what gave Him strength was to finish the work of God, the work that God gave him. Uh, also, uh, Jesus recognized that, that as he was working, that God was working through him. As the Lord was working, God was working through him. John 14, starting at verse 10, uh, Jesus said, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Jesus said, the Father is in me, and, and as he is in me, he is doing his work. I'm working, but it's really the Father that's working through me. And then the Holy Spirit works. In Philippians 2 and verse 13, the Bible says that for it is God who works in you. Well, how does God work in us? Well, it's through His Spirit which dwells in us. It is God who works in you both to will and to act or to do in order to fulfill His good purpose. So the Spirit is, is within us working and He's working uh, uh, so that we might will or desire to fulfill God's purpose, that we might actually carry it out. So the Father works, the Son works, the Holy Spirit works, and so the first reason we work is to reflect the character of God. There's a second reason, and that's uh, to serve others. We work in order to serve others. Now, regardless of what kind of work you do, uh, you should be able in some way to see how that's benefiting other people. So, for example, if you're a, a grocery clerk, well, how's that helping people? Well, that's, you're enabling uh, people to, to eat. Uh, you make it possible for them uh, to have food, put food on their table. Uh, you know, if you work in the store and you, you stock the shelves, you're making it possible. Uh, that's a service that you're providing for people to, uh, to eat every day. Uh, if you drive a bus uh, or taxi cab, you drive Uber, uh, you're providing people's transportation. That's a service. If you work in the medical field, you are uh, making it possible for people to, to become healthy, to overcome their disease conditions. So, so I want you to think about <clears throat> the work that you do and how is that benefiting others? Um, and, and so that's, that's a second purpose then uh, of our work. Every form of work in some way, sh we should be able to, to translate that into a form of benefit for others. Now, a third purpose uh, is to provide for others, to provide for others. So we talked about 
uh, reflecting God's character. We've talked about serving others. Thirdly, why do we work? We work in order to provide for others. And others include uh, both our family and those who are outside of our family. Listen to Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 28. Here the Apostle Paul says, Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. Okay, so he's talking about the before and after life. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work. Why? Doing something useful with their own hands so that they may have something to share with those in need. One of the reasons that we work is so that we can uh, share with other people, other people that, that have needs. That's how needs are taken care of. We work. In the book of Acts chapter 20, uh, there is this um, uh, meeting that the Apostle Paul has with the elders of Ephesus. And toward the end of um, his, his, uh, his speech to them, as he's preparing to depart, he, he says these words. This is Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse number 32. Paul says, Now I commit you to God and to the word of His grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. Now listen to this. He says, you yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs. So Paul is saying, look, I've, I've worked as I've been ministering. And, and with my very hands, I provided for my own needs. But, but not only that, he says, and for the needs of my companions. In other words, Paul's work not only benefited him personally, but it was for those who were working alongside with him. He says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work that we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So, so Paul is saying here, we work not just for our personal benefit, but we work to provide for others. Now, in 1 Timothy 5, chapter 8, he addresses the family issue. He says, anyone who does not provide for their own relatives, and especially for their own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's why when a person comes to our church and, and they're asking, you know, I need some help with my, with my rent or with my electricity, my question to them is, what, what's your family doing for you? Uh, we, are, we are obligated to, to provide for our families. That's why we work in for others. So we work because it's a reflection of God's character. We do it to serve others. We do it to provide for others. And then uh, fourthly, we, we work in order to fulfill our calling. To fulfill our calling. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, the Bible says that while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said... Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. God is in the business of calling people. And one thing that will enhance your, your strength in work is to, is to see your work as a calling from God. God has called you to do the things that you are doing for His glory and, and the benefit of others. Now here's what Jesus said in his prayer in John chapter 17 and verse 4. Jesus said to the Father, he said, I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. Did you hear that? Jesus says, this is how I brought you glory. You gave me work to do and I have finished that work. We need to have the same attitude in terms of work that God has called us. He, he has a purpose for us, and, and our challenge then is to fulfill that purpose. And there's a lot of ways of doing that, but, but that's, that's the challenge. Now, it's important we understand that we don't stop working when we retire. We just have a more flexible schedule. So we don't stop working. Uh, 
And, and one of the things that, that I'm seeking to do in my later years uh, is to invest in those who are younger, because in that sense, you're leaving a legacy. You're leaving, leaving something behind that others will benefit in terms of future. And again, in looking at the Apostle Paul, that's what he did. He invested in younger ministers. So uh, we've talked about the choice of work. We've talked about your purpose for work. Uh, let's finish then by talking about your relationships at work, at work. And what I want to talk about it, briefly uh, is your relationships with the people at work and then your relationship uh, to work itself. So let's start uh, by talking about uh, uh, relating to the people at work. I think it's true that uh, most people would enjoy their work better if it wasn't for certain people on their job. It's, it's people that either, either, either make it great or ruin it. Uh, you could probably have a job um, uh, cleaning honey pots. And if you had a, a, a great team and, and coworkers that you enjoy, you would enjoy that much more than maybe a, a more fancy job with people you, you just don't get along with. Now, when it comes to relating to others, uh, the Bible is about relationships. We talked about that in our relationship message. And uh, everything that the Bible teaches about relationships can and should be exercised on the job. For example, we, we looked at uh, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It, it talks about uh, the nature of love and what love does. Uh, love is patient, it, it's kind. Other factors, it's not self-seeking, it, it's not easily angered, doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Well, where do you practice that? Well, you practice that everywhere, and much of our time during the day is on the job. So we, we practice patience on the job. We practice kindness. We, we practice forgiveness. We, we practice uh, uh, self-control. All of these uh, qualities which describe in Scripture our relationships to everyone should be practiced on the job itself. Now, there are some specific instructions in Scripture about work, and it's expressed in, in, uh, in the culture of that day, in particular, speaking of masters and servants, of course, also in some translations uh, translated as slaves. And again, I encourage you to look at uh, slavery uh, in, in the uh, biblical times, Roman Empire, different from the slavery uh, in the, the United States. So, so what we find here, uh, let me share uh, two instances. Uh, the first is in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, um, we, we find here Paul is talking about uh, situations in which there is a non-Christian master. So he's talking to Christian servants and a non-Christian master. So let's, let's look that up. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2. Again, Paul speaking to Christians who are living in a, a non-Christian environment. Let's pick up our reading at verse number 18. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Paul says, Slaves or servants... Submit yourselves to your masters with all respect. Now, we would translate this in modern times as uh, employees and employers. So he says, first of all, you know, there, there needs to be some, uh, some submission, submission of yourselves. And that's simply a willingness um, to, to follow your leaders on the job. Uh, and, and to do it, he says, in the fear of God. And what he says is to do this not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. And that's a reality that many, many of us, uh, you know, we've had uh, supervisors or bosses or leaders who, uh, uh, who were not considerate. Uh, we've had leaders who uh, were harsh and, and, and leaders who... Uh, perhaps we're less qualified than even we are. Here Paul is saying, uh, as, as followers of Christ, in reverent fear of God, we need to respect them. And here's the reason. In verse 19, he says, For it is commendable. 
What's commendable? He says it's commendable if a person bears up under the pain of unjust suffering. Now, um, on the job, there's a lot of suffering that happens. And a lot of the suffering that happens on the job is not fair. Uh, you know, one of the favorite sayings of kids is, oh, this is not fair, this is not fair. Well, it's, adults say that too, and they'll say that on the job. Uh, here, here, Peter is, is saying it's commendable if you're able to, to bear up under the pain of that unjust suffering because you're conscious of God. And he says, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for wrong and endure it? Uh, in other words, you, know, you may do something wrong on the job uh, and you're punished for that. Peter says, there's, there's nothing to, to, to commend you about bearing under that suffering. He says, however, he says, if you suffer for doing good, if you suffer for doing good, and you endure it. This is commendable before God. And then he says, verse 21, he says, to this end you were called. And again, I'm talking about calling. This is a more general calling to bearing up under unjust suffering. He says, because Christ suffered for you and his suffering was demonstrated on the cross of Calvary when he died for our sins. That was unjust suffering. And he, he said he did that, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And so here, here is some specific instruction in terms of, uh, of work and the Christian. And uh, Ephesians, let me mention last, one last one. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 and following. Again, Paul's addressing servants or slaves. He says, to obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Now, in this instance, he's talking uh, Christian uh, uh, employer, Christian employee, their brothers. Verse 6, he says, Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as servants, bond servants, slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. In other words, you know the old saying, uh, when the cat's away, what's the rest of that? the mice will play. It's human nature. And so what Paul is saying here uh, is, is, is when, when the boss is away, you, you are still going to do your best because you're not there to please him or her. What he says here, uh, verse 7, to serve wholeheartedly, to do your best, give your all as if you were serving the Lord and not people. You know, what a motivation that, that the work that we do, we're not really working for man. Rather, the work that we do, God is our boss. God is our leader. God is our supervisor. He says, now, you know that the Lord will reward each of you for whatever good that you do, whether, whether they're slave or free. Now, what he also does in verse 9 is he addresses uh, the masters, or again, as we're applying this, the employers. He says to treat your slaves, treat your employees in the same way. Don't threaten them, since you know that he who both is both their master and yours in heaven, meaning God, he says, and there's no favoritism with him. So, so here again, um, the Bible gives some uh, direct instructions that I think apply in the work situation. Now let's, let's, let's wind up then by talking about this idea of, of uh, you as a, a, a working person and relating to the job itself. We talked about relating to people on the job. Now let's talk about the job itself. Well, the first thing is uh, the job is not your source of life. Now, I've made this, uh, this statement and, 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 and trying to emphasize this principle when I talked about relationships, that other people are not your source of ultimate life. That, that money and material things are not your ultimate source of life, and neither is your job, neither is your work. It's, it's interesting in our culture um, how, how much we elevate work to be uh, the, the ultimate thing. Um, there's, a, there's a statement uh, that's made about work, uh, play, and worship, and uh, the saying goes, we worship our work we work at our play, 
and we play at our worship. And again, that kind of goes to show how, how people elevate work above everything else. But, but work is not our source of life. The other thing is, work is not limited to your job. So for example, we use the expression uh, volunteer work, church work. And again, work does not stop when, when you retire. And, and then the last thing I, I think that's, that's critical here to understand is that if you do have a job, you need to understand that you will never be compensated for what you are worth. And, and a lot of people are frustrated by that. Uh, you'll, you'll never be compensated. See, see, salaries are not based on the person, they're based on the job. I've hired people in the past, and before I meet anyone, I already have in mind what I'm going to pay because that, that salary, that compensation is based on the job, not on the person. And so you're, you're not going to be compensated for what, you work, what you're worth. You're not going to be compensated according to your direct uh, effort or effectiveness. And uh, uh, because jobs, again, and compensation basically... Uh, they're determined by, by rank, by longevity, and by what, whatever company that you work for. If you work for the government, there's a scale. Now, the exception maybe is uh, if you're in sales, you know, but even there, uh, a company will control your commission. Or uh, if you own a business, and if you own a business, you're going to work hard. And again, there's some, some relationship between how hard you work, but there's other factors that's going to affect uh, your income. Uh, I think the scripture teaches the principle here that it's the Lord that's going to reward you ultimately for the work that you do. The Lord's going to do that, and he's going to compensate you uh, even more than what you deserve. So, so what have we said here uh, today? Um, the Bible has lots of insights, lots of teaching about work, that work is from God, it's man that's made it toil, and uh, there's some things the scripture says about our choice of work, uh, our reason to work, and then the relationships that we have through work. So my prayer is that through, through our work, uh, we can uh, both benefit others and we can glorify God. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for who you are. You're a God who works. And we thank you for the blessing of work. And we pray that we can recognize that the work that we do here on this earth, uh, even though we may work for an earthly company or, or people, that ultimately we're working for you. Help us to live by that principle for your glory and the good of others. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you so much again for joining us today. I want to remind you that at 1215 uh, we have a live uh, presentation for kids. We call it Kids Talk. And also at 5 o'clock uh, we will be on live taking your prayer request and praying for you. Just go to our website at holgatecoc.com, click on the links, and join us there. Also, if you're interested in learning more about uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you have a desire to be baptized or want to learn more about our church or our ministries, please email us at contact us at holgatecoc.com.
I got one more thing I want to tell you. Y'all ain't gonna believe this now. Listen, some folks don't go to church. Don't go to church. 